I want to talk about Pong. The last few videos were just too depressing and I wanted to talk about something fun for once, you know? Nothing to do with the depressing talk of late stage capitalism, widespread abuse or, I don't know, koalas kidnapping dogs for sport or some other unhinged stories like that. So I wanted to talk about Pong. A game, a fun game, a video game. And why Pong was, clickbait title, the greatest video game ever made. Or at least that was how the title was originally going to be. Uh, because I was interested in how the game was so well designed. And you might be wondering, Fat Man, what are you talking about? Pong is just two lines and a dot bouncing around. There's no design in that. And that's where you're wrong. Think about it. Video games back then had only two colors, black and white, and controllers at a total of four buttons, and not four buttons and four directions, just four buttons. And back then, video game programmer or video game designer as jobs didn't even exist because, you know, programming language and video games didn't really exist. You and like maybe 20 other people in the whole world were creating an entirely new art form. You, specifically, handsome beautiful, smart, and all you had were four buttons and two colors, and as much processing power as this. This is not even a joke, this thing controls the light in my room and has four buttons. Pong ran on a mechanical circuit similar to this, and also had four buttons, which means given the right circumstances, this thing could probably run Pong. Given all that, someone had to design a game to work within those limitations that was fun, and, and that person is called... Ralph Bayer for the Magnavox Odyssey? I thought Pong was made for Atari. Oh, oh, no, no, no. We're not deep diving into the Magnavox Pong lawsuit. This is supposed to be a fun video. It, it's supposed to be a fun video, right? Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be a fun video. So we're not talking about judicial nightmare of late stage capitalism. Much. We'll talk about the Magnavox lawsuit a little bit and then we'll go back to Pong, okay? The Magnavox Odyssey was the first ever home console and two of the games in it were table tennis and tennis and they were basically Pong's precursors. But they were really unpolished. They didn't even keep track of scores. You had to do that yourself, like with pencil and paper. And tennis was basically the table tennis game with a different overlay, like a physical overlay, a piece of paper you had to put over the TV screen. So when Alan Alcon created Pong for Atari, Magnavox sued Atari for copying their revolutionary patented idea of controlling objects on a screen with a controller. And if you're smart, and I know my audiences are, you'll recognize this as a pattern troll, an entity that used a wide generalized pattern that could describe almost anything in a field in order to file lawsuits for money. And the judge of the time, John Grady, ruled that Bayer held the pioneering pattern for video game art. An insane statement to make. It's like saying he pioneered drawing. You cannot pattern art. The judge gave the precedent that any video game where machine control element hits a player control element on a video, which is the basis for almost every single video game out there, violated the pattern. Pattern trolls have sued numerous people who did genuinely innovative work over the years based on some small part of their design that somewhat resembles the original pattern. Screw those guys. Screw pattern trolls like Magnavox. Magnavox, who single-handedly set back video game development by nearly a decade because of their ceaseless lawsuit. Magnavox, when adjusted for inflation, won more than half a billion dollars in lawsuit over 20 years, destroying the dreams of potential game designers everywhere. Magnavox stomping down on the proletariat's ability to manufacture their own This is a happy video, not an anti-capitalism video. Think happy thoughts. We're going to talk about Pong, alright? Alright. The cool thing about Pong is that it is the first commercial video game ever designed. And I'm using those words very specifically. Because while Magnavox Odyssey was indeed the first video game console, and the games on it were all video games in a 
technical sense, they weren't really design. They were more simulations or basic ideas chopped together, like a game of catch or roulette or sports stuff. They are games that you can play even without the console, but Pong is a game you can only play on a machine made to run Pong. It wasn't a simulation or a digital remake. It was a multiplayer game designed to work with only four buttons, with mechanics very distinct and unique to its design. A lot of its basic design philosophies are still being used in the industry today. It's the first video game to actually help you count scores, which we will come to know today as vertical game design, which is the idea of creating a visually understandable gauge that rise and fall to give a sense of progress. One of those things we now know today as stats. And then we have the Pong paddles. Alan Elcon, when designing the game, felt that just having the ball bounce off the paddle was too simple. So he divided each paddle into eight segments with each segment changing the angle of return. This is horizontal design, a philosophy of giving player more to do with an interaction. Your modern equivalent would be having different skills and abilities, the ability to jump, for example. And finally, because of a circuit defect, the paddles couldn't reach the top or the bottom of the screen, but instead of spending time and money fixing it, Elcon decided to just leave it in as an open goal. What he had accidentally made was the world's first recorded video game bug that a designer decided not to fix. A time-honored tradition, by the way. All of these will go on to define video games. We still use many of these concepts today, which is why Pong is such an interesting game to talk about. At the time of its creation, it held the title of the greatest video game ever made. Not just because it was the only video game ever made, I mean, it wasn't, but because it did something no other video games did before. It improved upon an existing game with design choices. Unlike Bayer, who joked that they should have stopped designing games after their tennis cartridge. Or at least I think he said it. It's supposedly quoted within a book, but it's not available in any libraries nearby, and I'm not about to pay over 100 fucking dollars for a copy. Holy shit, these books are way too expensive. Which, unlike my books, which are very affordable, which you can buy from my bio link in the description below. Wink! What, I'm not supposed to say a wink? Why did you put it in the teleprompter? Elcon took an idea and ran with it, with creativity and a human touch, which is why I think it deserves the title of being the most interesting video game ever. What? There were other games? We're not talking about Magnavox Odyssey, right? Those games are shit. There are other games other than those. Are they interesting? Very interesting. Well, let's talk about Bouncing Ball is possibly the earliest record of an interactive video game, a video that can be interacted with live updates. It was used at MIT for education about the technology by simulating a bouncing ball. No shit. There are a few names tied to it, Charles Adams, John Gilmore, and Oliver Abbott. Oliver was the original creator of the program with Gilmore and Adams using and modifying it in the following years. But what's interesting is that sometime between 1949 and 1953, someone added a hole to the floor, and the goal became to adjust the ball bounce frequency to make it fall through the hole, turning it from a physics animation renderer into an interactive video game. It's a fascinating topic to talk about because it dives into human nature itself. Without even knowing it was possible, without even the term video games existing, someone out there still made games. Without any training or understanding of the craft, without financial incentive like Magnavox or Atari, they still made it. It speaks to something innate in human nature, to create rules and interaction where none are to be found. The oldest board game we know of dates back 6,000 years, and we're not even considering games drawn on floor. What was the predecessor to The Floor is Lava? When was the first hopscotch line washed away by the sea or wind? Whenever we say that games are just for children or that we will grow out of them with time, my mind kind of boggles. Like the game Boggle! It's interesting, isn't it? By the theory of evolution, it means that somewhere along humanity's timeline, the act of games, playing and creating them, intertwined with survival. 
At some point, our ancestors who made and played games likely had a higher chance of survival than those who didn't. And an even more pertinent question, how much of game design and creation are natural human intuition, and how much of it requires the free hand of the market to drive its innovation? Because Bouncing Ball didn't come about because someone innovated to make money. It was made out of a need and want. Modern games have become this monolithic industry. Even board games are funded for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars on Kickstarter. Unlike my board game, designed by the indie game designer, me, which is affordable and available in almost nowhere, that's not a good pitch. But some people might argue that without the innovations of the market, wouldn't our game controllers still be stuck as the toaster boxes of the Magnavox Odyssey? And yes, we may have destroyed Blizzard and created the hellscape companies of EA and Ubisoft, but we wouldn't have been able to make all these improvements in gameplay and graphic without the guiding, innovative force of free market <laughs> I get you, I lied. This is an anti-capitalism video. Let's talk about... That's right, comrades. We're talking about the first real video game designed for design gaming with human... Design games, you know what I mean. Space Wars was initially developed in 1961, 10 years before Pong at MIT by Steve Russell, Martin Grayetz, and Wayne Wee Tannen. That's really his name, I, I, I think. And I say initially developed because this group was joined by others as the development went on. And we'll get to that. It's a pretty nice game. Two spaceships spawn on the map and they try to take each other out with missiles. That's it. But over time, they added things like a star fuel background, a working gravity well to affect their environment, the ability to teleport and timers and stuff. And all these are cool. They're all game design stuff that I covered in the Pong section. And more. For example, the star fuel was added because it was hard to see the spaceships moving on a black background. That's graphic design in video games. And the star field is also 100% realistic because a guy got annoyed that it wasn't realistic enough and wrote an entire program to make it more realistic. And that's what truly made Space Wars amazing. The culture it created. The game from its inception was public domain, which makes it the first open source computer game. Any researcher at any university with a computer could just contact Russell and ask for the code. He would just give it to them for free. And if he couldn't for some reason, they were allowed to make their own. The code for the game was passed around from person to person, and every now and then, they made their own changes. There are certain records that they made the precursor to the rumble feature that we had in our controllers. That they even made the first FPS game mode. And because it was hard to control the ships with the switches built into the computer, a couple of them just sat around and came up with the first ever gamepad, 15 years before anything remotely like it even existed. These nerds flew forward in time until Nolan Bushnell took that idea and made the first arcade video game, which later led him to founding Atari and creating Pong. <laughs> Over the last six decades, major game companies have spent billions of dollars marketing to us, trying to convince us of the value of AAA titles by painting a narrative that these innovations and growth in the technology and art was impossible without the hands of companies and the free market. And for a long time, that's what I thought too. How are we supposed to get a game with the graphics and story of The Last of Us without crunching our employees into the ground? How are developers supposed to bet on innovative gameplay without having legal protections and patents? So forgive me if I seem overly excited to find out that not only does it not have to be that way, it wasn't like this originally. We can draw a direct line from the developmental culture of Space Wars to the indie game dev scene of today. The original code of Space Wars took 4 people 200 hours to write in 6 weeks. That's right, considering the limitations of programming languages back then, we can assume that was the first ever game jam. And while Space Wars' tiny community's development took the game industry forward by 20 years, it was Magnavox's legal market manipulation that set the art form back by the same amount. Games are made for the people and by the people. Always have, always will be. And these companies have long proved that they don't understand the art in it. 
I haven't touched a major company's game in five years and I find myself not hungering for choices. Those amazing graphics and story I wanted from The Last of Us, I managed to get it from Stray. And as someone who was disappointed in the innovation of fighting games from this past decade, I found the most innovative fighting games, perhaps the most innovative gameplay ever, in this tiny indie game called Your Only Move Is Hustle. For every XCOM, there's a troubleshooter. Bought by another Call of Duty, play some bright memories. It's okay to not get the latest shiny thing. We all know, skulls and bones look like shit. Go play some indie games, support smaller companies and creators. Because I promise you, if we keep letting these major companies get their way, they would have done the same thing Ralph Bayer said he wanted, and we would never have gotten past Magnavox's tennis. In Harrington Bomberby's video about the Roblox oof, he talked about how people like Tommy Tellerico is trying to leave their mark on gaming history by erasing, stealing, and overshadowing the works of others. But look at this story here. We don't need an evil bad guy like Tommy Tellerico to do that. It helps, but we don't need it. Because as far as I can tell, everyone who worked on Magnavox, Odyssey, and Pong genuinely seemed to have a passion for games. But decades of unchecked capitalism have created a society that don't see games as more than a money-making industry. Everyone knows Pong, some people might even know of Magnavox, but barely anyone knows of the history of Space Wars. We as a society have decided to forget Space Wars in pursuit of games with big dollar signs. We have equated money to historical success, and that is having real consequences on the history that we are choosing to preserve. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I decided to use this episode to showcase my Elite Gamer Skills TM. As you can tell from this footage of me getting my ass handed to me. Or this footage of me missing a bunch of shots at point blank. Anyway, one of the arguments against the developmental model of Space War, which I realized while editing that I've been pronouncing as Space Wars with an S, was that the computer that ran it adjusted for inflation cost around a million dollars in today's money. Which honestly is a fair criticism. But also, I think it supports the idea of collective creations. Pong was developed for about $400,000 equivalent, and having a game developed on a computer that everyone chipped in a little for in tuition fees that was then freely available to anyone who wanted it can honestly be a comparable model to the capitalistic one of having a single one made to be sold only to people who could afford it. I'm not really here to justify the economics of it, they are both pretty much the same in my eyes. I just wanted to look at the culture of game development in this video. Anyway, thanks to my patrons for continuing to support me. I, I don't really know why they do that, but thank you. They get access to my videos a week earlier, so if that sounds good, or if you just want me to keep doing this, go check my Patreon out. I poked some fun of the book They Create Worlds, the story of the people and companies that shaped the video game industry by Alexander Smith, but honestly, it's a really cool book. I couldn't afford the full copy, but I've read excerpts of it, and the research that Alexander have put up on their blog was a great jumping off point for this video. If you can afford the book, you should definitely check it out. Links in the description. But uh, Alexander, if you're watching, you gotta lower the price a little, my man. It's it's just way too expensive. But uh, that's it for now. See you, everyone. Bye.